Modern. 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 We're prepping for a voyage. Modern. The force of an old fashioned equals whiskey mass times bitters acceleration. Why don't you make that a double? Modern Bar Cart. What's shaking, cocktail fans? Welcome to episode 152 of the Modern Bar Cart podcast. I'm your host, Modern Bar Cart CEO Eric Koslick. Thanks for joining me for this interview episode where we sit down with the best and brightest minds in the spirits and cocktail world so that we can share their secrets with you. This time around, I have the great pleasure to spend some time chatting with Derek Sandhouse, widely regarded as the English-speaking authority on Baijo, a spirit that is produced in greater volume than perhaps any other in the world, and yet one that is largely unknown and misunderstood here in North America. During this interview, Derek and I unpack a whole slew of information about Baijo, including its almost shocking production methods, its unique terroir, and some of the cultural forces that shape its regional variances across China. But before we do that, let's take a little pit stop first so that you can make yourself a drink. This episode's featured cocktail is The Good Fortune. Developed by former podcast guest and tiki bartender extraordinaire Shannon Mustafer, this unique cocktail was created specifically for Ming River Baijiu, which is Derek's brand that he developed to help spread Baijiu to the West. To make the good fortune, you'll need an ounce and a half of Sichuan peppercorn-infused Ming River Strong Aroma Baijiu, one half ounce whiskey, And because the type of whiskey isn't stipulated, I'd recommend starting with something mild like bourbon or Irish whiskey, and then work your way up to something more robust if you think the drink can handle it. One ounce mango juice, one half ounce lemon juice, and three quarters of an ounce of clove syrup. Combine these ingredients in a cocktail shaker with ice, shake vigorously for about 15 seconds, then strain into a large rocks glass over crushed ice and garnish with a fragrant bouquet of mint. Now, for all our home bartenders listening, let's talk about sourcing and prepping a few of these ingredients. For Sichuan peppercorns, mango juice, and whole cloves, I lean in two very, very different directions. On one hand, you're gonna wanna pick these up online via Amazon or another large online retailer. On the other hand, if you happen to live near any international markets that specialize in global cuisine, you could probably pick up all three of these ingredients there. A couple more notes on process. To infuse your Ming River Baijiu with peppercorns. Well, first you need a bottle of Ming River Baijiu. So head to shopmingriver.com and order a bottle right to your doorstep if you live here in the US. Word to the wise, you're probably gonna have to sign for it. So if you're one of those working from home, this might be a good opportunity to do that. With shipping, it's gonna cost you around 40 bucks, which is a great deal because it's a delicious bottle. Then, to infuse with peppercorns, you're gonna wanna throw just a small handful of your Szechuan peppercorns in the bottle overnight. If you taste the bottle the next day and you still want more of that peppery flavor infused in there, you can add a little bit more and, and wait longer, but a light touch with infused spirits is important when you're just starting out because otherwise you really run the risk of ruining the entire bottle if you get overzealous. Next, on to the clove syrup. Similarly, you're gonna wanna throw just a small handful of whole cloves, not ground cloves if you can help it. Always try for whole cloves in your one-to-one sugar-to-water mixture on the stovetop, stirring until the sugar's dissolved. Once you're approaching a simmer, go ahead and cut the heat and leave the lid on your saucepan for about an hour or two before you strain out the cloves and bottle your syrup for the fridge. I know those were a lot of instructions, but if you do your prep work well, the Good Fortune Cocktail by Shannon Mustafer would be an excellent drink to serve in bulk the next time you host a socially distant gathering to celebrate the summer. So, now that you're all fueled up with a spicy, sweet, tropical little sipper, let's turn our attention back to the interview. In this eye-opening conversation with Baijiu expert Derek Sandhouse, some of the topics we discuss include what Baijiu is, which might seem like a simple definitions game, but it's way more interesting than that. How Derek came to spend years in China studying the culture and learning as much as possible about Baijiu and the people who make and enjoy it. 
What sort of microbial magic needs to happen in order to produce liquid alcohol from a solid fermentable mash? And to that end, what Baijo shares in common with other spirits like open fermented mezcal and dunder fortified Jamaican rum? We talk about two of Derek's books, Baijo, The Essential Guide to Chinese Spirits, and Drunk in China, the more recent of the two. We give you a crash course in the most popular styles of Baijo and the regional cuisines they evolved to complement. Then we talk about where Baijo might be heading in the coming years and decades. We imagine what it would be like to share a bottle of Baijo with legendary 8th century Chinese drinker and poet Li Bai, and much, much more. Derek is a fascinating guy to interview, and the amount of time he's spent researching and immersing himself in Chinese culture is a huge asset because the things he shares don't feel purely academic. They're based on real things he's tasted, real places he's visited, and real people whom he's learned from. But listener, beware. This is one of those episodes that you may want to listen to a few times in order to really wrap your head around Baijo. And believe me, I'm still on a pretty steep learning curve here myself. As a supplement, I'm planning on hosting an Instagram live tasting and cocktail demo featuring Ming River Baijo, where I walk you through a tasting and make a drink or two using this incredible spirit. So if you're hungry for more, that will probably take place sometime late afternoon or early evening East Coast time on Friday, June 19th, the day after this episode launches. We'll probably have a countdown timer on our Instagram story and an official announcement of the exact time by then as well. So keep your eyes peeled. With that, please enjoy this fascinating conversation with Baijo expert, author, and entrepreneur, Derek Sandhaus. Derek, thanks for being on the podcast. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. So I've been getting increasingly excited about this conversation as it has approached because you are, you know, a, a really incredible authority on Baiju, which we're going to delve really deep into here in this conversation. Uh, and you were kind enough to throw me some resources that I could nerd out on beforehand. So uh, I've done my homework. Uh, you obviously have a lot of experience to share with us. Why don't we start uh, by having you tell our listeners a little bit about who you are and how you came to be in the Baiju space? Sure. So um, I am a writer um, who got started writing mostly about Chinese history and culture uh, when I was living in Shanghai between 2006 and 2011. Um, after I left Shanghai, I moved with my wife to Chengdu, which is the capital of Sichuan province in southwestern China. And while I was there, I became very interested in one of the biggest uh, industries in Sichuan, which is um, distilling spirits. So what I discovered when I was down there is that um, Baijiu, this uh, you know kind of ubiquitous grain alcohol that you see at all sorts of uh, social occasions and professional occasions in China, always served at dinner, always in little tiny shot glasses that you take a ton of. Um, and something that's taste is quite unlike that of uh, a lot of the uh, liquors that we grow up with in America and Europe. Um, it, it's, a, it's a drink that's not very well liked um, among people from other countries. Uh, so I'd never given it proper thought, but I was seeing it all around me when I moved down to Sichuan. So what I decided... Uh, to do was to begin researching, uh, going around to different distilleries, talking to different people in the industry and seeing if I could figure out what it was that made this such an important special drink in China and yet so kind of overlooked and dismissed by people in other countries. And um, what I discovered uh, pretty quickly into my research project was um, a couple important things. Uh, one was that uh, Baijo is not uh, like one specific type of alcohol, but it's a it's a category of alcohols, 12 in all. And um, they can taste very different from one another. So um, Baijo wasn't even what I thought it was when I started the project. Um, and then uh, the other thing I learned really quickly is that there are many quite wonderful and exciting Baijos. So... Um, from there, it just became a process uh, where over the next couple of years, I traveled around the country, met people who were making different styles of Baijo and kind of read everything I could get my hands on um, in English and Chinese um, 
about uh, this this category of spirits to try to like figure it out and hopefully um, explain it to people who don't have the chance to go to China and and learn the language. Yeah, um, and obviously there's a there's a huge cultural divide for most of us between um, the way people um, kind of treat spirits, whether distilled or from, you know, or, or alcoholic fermented beverages and, you know, and the food in China, um, you know, what we get as Chinese food here in the U.S. is kind of like, you know, what American Italian food is to, you know, real food in Italy. Like the, some, like the, the, there's a lot that gets lost in translation. Um, so I imagine it was probably a huge asset for you to be able to check out some of those resources actually in Chinese. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think a lot of the interactions we have with China and Chinese flavor um, comes in in the United States, at least, is influenced by the fact that um, the overwhelming majority of um, Chinese who immigrated to the United States, past and present, come from like a very narrow region of southeastern China, um, which by historical accident, um, happens to be one of the only parts of China that doesn't drink much baijiu. So um, a lot of the foods and flavors that we get introduced to are very different from the flavors and foods and drinks that they have in other parts of China. So China is a fantastically um, diverse country. And historically, it's a collection of many different cultures that are all kind of in one geographic region. Um, so, you know, Northeastern Chinese culture bears very little resemblance to Southwestern Chinese culture. So to really kind of unpack and learn Baijo, you really have to know a lot about these regional differences in both like what they're eating, but also what kind of flavors they find desirable. And that, that is a really, a, a missing piece for a lot of people in understanding, uh, what Baijiu producers are going for when they create their drinks. Yeah, and there, there's a couple of podcast episodes that I want to put a pin in right now for our listeners um, who may be joining us having not listened to these other episodes. Uh, I have an interview with a sake expert, Lara Victoria, and that's a two-part series where we really unpack sake. Uh, so that's uh, there. There's going to be some similarities uh, between this conversation and and those two episodes. And then uh, I also have an interview with my friend Taka Amano, who actually uh, creates shochu, which is a Japanese style. Uh, distilled spirit here in the U.S. and um, you know some of the processes here, especially pertaining to mold, are are also going to bear some resemblance as we move forward. So for anyone who gets to the end of this conversation and says, "Man, I I, I want more. I want more of this type of thing that that seems a little bit foreign to me, but that is actually really compelling." Um, check out those uh, the sake episodes with Lara and the shochu episode with Taka uh, because there's going to be some some parallels. Uh, although Baijo is is certainly uh, more different still than some of these other uh, spirits that we've covered in the past. So before we jump into uh, some really compelling stuff about how Baijo is made from solids rather than liquids like we're used to here in the U.S. with our distiller's beer that goes into the stills, uh, let's talk about the word itself, because you actually called out a mistake that I had on my interview questions. I spelled it wrong, which is never a good place to start. And I feel like I may even be pronouncing it wrong when I pronounce it almost phonetically, calling it baiju. Uh, so can you just take us through the spelling, the pronunciation, and then maybe that'll allow us to segue into how it's different uh, from some other Asian spirits like uh, soju and shochu, for example. Okay, yeah, those are two topics that kind of uh, dovetail very light, nicely into one another. So, um, baijiu is a word in Mandarin Chinese. It's, uh, you know, rendered in Roman characters, B-A-I-J-I-U, and it means essentially white alcohol. So, um the way that I tell people to pronounce it usually is like um, you say like bye, like that's pretty straightforward. Like you're saying goodbye to someone. And then uh, the second word is closer to like, I guess you might phonetically write it like J Y O. So like geo, 
um, like the sil- the first syllable in the Italian name Giovanni, like uh, so by Gio is 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 how it is roughly pronounced, and uh, it's a word that's not terribly um, historic in in China. So this it became the word for like all types of traditional Chinese spirits um around the 1950s but before that time the word for liquor in china was um actually like burnt alcohol or in uh, mandarin shaojiu which is the same word as soju in korean or shochu in japanese so really this this is a family of east asian spirits and and what they have in common is a, a single origin uh, they all tend to be grain based in their their oldest forms. Um, you know, Korea and Japan have gotten into some some other ingredients as well over time. Um, and they're all um, fermented using like naturally harvested like yeasts and molds. Right, right. And uh, like even as your <laughs> like one other little, uh, I guess, etymological reference here for folks is that uh in the west we also have references to burnt alcohol right brandy coming mm-hmm. from the, Bra- the brand of in burnt burnt wine uh literally sure. so so uh you know it's sort of following in that tradition um during uh some of the materials you you actually uh gave me a, a tip to attend a um, WSET webinar WSET being the wine and spirits education trust uh that does a lot uh actually increasingly more spirits education these days they've really beefed up their their spirits offerings um as a different set of course materials than their traditional wine offerings which i love um but in that uh webinar you mentioned a couple things um you mentioned that uh, you know it comes uh, the baijiu comes from this kind of older tradition called huanzhou, which is yellow alcohol. So could you maybe talk a little bit more about huanzhou and uh, how, at least in as far as you understand it, uh, baijiu kind of evolved to be what it is today. Sure. So in the oldest period of China, um, like the archaeological record from 9,000 years ago, we find the oldest types of alcohol in China. And um, they tend to be kind of hybrid alcohols that use a lot of different ingredients that were like separated in uh, European and like Middle Eastern winemaking, where you typically have like wine, beer, and mead in the ancient world uh, made from fruit, uh, grain, and honey, respectively. But um, these ancient Chinese drinks combined all of those ingredients. Um, and those we think were just probably naturally uh, fermented with wild yeast uh, that lived in the air. Uh, we don't know a ton about them be- beyond that point. But when the written record begins uh, several thousand years later, um, you start seeing like ancient varieties of like wine and beer um, get replaced by a drink that's called Jiu, um, which is like the Jiu and Bai Jiu. Um, around like two to 1000 uh, BC. And what separated Joe from these earlier alcoholic beverages is that Joe used this ingredient called chu, uh, spelled uh, Q-U in English. And chu was essentially a grain that had been processed um, with some water usually and allowed to begin naturally decomposing so that it would um, you know, absorb whatever microorganisms lived in the air. So um, in this order, you have uh, mold, yeast, and bacteria that, that gets inside of chew. And once you have, you know, st- kind of started the fermentation process, you can freeze these chemical reactions within the chew by um, just drying it out in the sun. So what they figured is if you started a fermentation froze it in motion, you could mix that chew with um, grains to instigate fermentation at any time. Uh, Like a chew will store and last for a few years. So that became the basis um, at first of Chinese and uh, by extension, East Asian winemaking. 
Um, but it also is the ingredient that is used in pretty much all um, Chinese fermented products from uh, you know, soy sauce to tofu. They all use some kind of chew to, uh, to start fermentation. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, and and this is fascinating to me because uh, we'll, we'll get more into this uh, in a moment here. Probably not as deep as we got into the uh, WSET webinar, which they they referenced that they were going to throw that up on YouTube. So I will try to um, for folks who are interested in the technical granularity of the distillation process. Um, I'll, I'll try and throw a link to that in the show notes page if and when uh, it's available. But what fascinates me about the chew is that it allows, A, you've got this aspect where you can almost like freeze and like trans transport microorganisms not necessarily across space but across time right you you've frozen the the process by drying it out in the sun and then as you were able to you can kind of dope it into your fermentation and then by extension the distillation process whenever you need to whenever the timing is right and then the other thing that fascinates me about it is that you know we've got this trifecta of microorganisms at play in the mold, yeast, and bacteria. And as you mentioned, you said in that order. We'll get to why that order is important here in just a moment. Mm -hmm. But uh, most of us here in the U.S., when we think of either brewing, winemaking, or distillation, we think of a single microorganism, yeast. Um, And I, I think part of that is us overlooking the role that bacteria play in the distillation process, because wherever there's yeast, there are bacteria. I had a really great interview with distiller Brian Davis, who did an incredible job kind of almost dramatizing this age old battle between bacteria and yeast and how the yeast have almost um, kind of domesticated humans to aid them in that battle. So um, I'll try and link to that in the show notes as well. But take us a little bit more through the, the, the fermentation process whereby we somehow get a alcohol product out of a solid, right? Because I think that's the most mind-blowing part of this process for me and most listeners. Sure. So this um, this drink that pops up a few thousand years ago called Joe, um, or um, this would actually be the same as Huangzhou that we were talking about earlier, yellow wine, which is just now uh, like a catch-all term for any traditional Chinese uh, fermented beverage made with grain and chew. Um, so the way that this works, um, I, I often translate um, this as grain wine in, in English um, because I know for most people that's kind of a contradiction of term. You think of any like fermented grain beverage as being a beer and any fermented uh, fruit beverage as being a wine. But this drink that comes out of it is quite a bit different than a beer so the the way that it works is when you um when you combine chew with grain you are doing two processes that are done separately in beer making Um, the first is you're doing sacrification which is the transformation of starches into sugar and you're also doing fermentation which is the uh transformation of sugars into alcohol so Um, We often kind of, I think, overlook like the transformation of starch when we're talking about beer, but that's incredibly important because with with a grain, it's, you know, not, you can't just mix a grain straight with yeast and expect to get, uh, you know, any alcohol out of it. You've got to uh, process it in some way to prepare it for the yeast to, to make, to make an alcoholic beverage. So what happens in the West is we use malting to, to do this, where we sprout the grain and we heat it up a little bit. Um, but what you're doing in uh, Chinese alcohol is you're taking a grain, usually you steam the grain first to kind of start breaking the grain's cellular structure down. And then you mix it together with chew that's been like crushed into a powder. So what happens is the starch begins getting broken down by the mold in the grain. Um, and the the enzymes will that are produced by this will break down the starches into sugars at the same time you have yeast in the chew so the yeast in the chew is 
taking that that uh, sugar as it's being created and turning it directly into alcohol. Um, what's also interesting about the chew um, that many people um, are surprised by is that uh, the the raw material, the, that solid grain that you start with is still solid at this point. So you're producing alcohol in a solid batch of grains. Um, uh, you can maybe visualize this by thinking of like Korean kimchi, which is also produced by, you know, a solid fermented product that is created with naturally um, harvested uh, chew-like substance. So you've got this solid grain um, that's got alcohol inside of it. So um, when you're making a traditional Chinese, uh, dis not distilled, um, when you're making a traditional Chinese fermented beverage, you get the alcohol out by pressing it like you might grapes before you prepare them for winemaking. So you press the alcohol out and you can drink it. And if you're not distilling, that's the end of the process. Right, right. And I think there was, uh, I think on your website, you have like a pretty cool uh, visual of uh, some people operating one of those presses. Is that accurate? Did I see that on your website? I'm not sure if you did. Hmm. Okay. Well, there is an article. I'll try and find. I looked at a couple of articles, um, and I will try to uh, link to those as um, resources on the website. So um, there's there's some pretty good stuff out there. Uh, so we've got a little bit of an understanding of how the the chew works to create alcohol from two ostensibly solid substances. Now, it, it, once you dope the chew into this steamed grain uh mm -hmm. it, it sits largely in pits is that correct okay so in in the older chinese alcohols the the huangzhou's um you would be usually fermenting in a stone jar um you just kind of like leave it out in a you know usually a dark place uh, sometimes underground um, let, let the fermentation happen for a few days. Um, most of the older drinks are made from rice and millet. Um, and with, with baijiu, typically you're using sorghum, which uh, became a popular grain uh, later on in China. Um, so in, in baijiu, depending on what type of baijiu you're making, you're going to be, um, this, you're probably leaving it for about a week up to several months uh, for fermentation. And um, some of the types of baijiu still use stone jars as the primary method. Some of them uh, for higher yield purposes use like uh, stone pits that are literally just pits dug out of the ground. And then um, there's a style of baijiu, um, the kind that uh, my company, Ming River, makes, um, Strong Aroma Baijiu, which is a, a, the most popular style of baijiu in China. And that performs fermentation in large uh, mud pits that are dug out of the ground and have clay walls. I'm wondering if you could get away with something like that in the U.S. Like part of me thinks no. <laughs> well, I mean, it... I, I don't know what the regulations are. There are no regulations for Baijiu in the United States because the United States, um, the TTB doesn't recognize Baijiu as existing at all. Um, so I, I imagine that you might be able to get away with it, but it would require, um, you know, educating the food safety uh, professionals who would give you approval to do so, uh, because this is a process that doesn't really have much of a parallel outside of China. Right. You would have to basically uh, face up to somebody with a clipboard and say, look, yeah, no worries. I'm just, you know, first we throw a little mold in and then, you know, we let the bacteria get to it after the yeast are done. It's not a big deal. You know, just let it happen. Just it's fine. It's fine. Uh, <laughs> so, I, don't, I don't know that it's so different from a lot of the things that are going on in bread making, for example, or, you know, the making mm -hmm. of kimchi or sauerkraut or all, all sorts of processes use uh, complicated, uh, you know, fermentation 
Right, right. Uh, and so, all right, we've got Pitts, we've got Chu, we've got this um, incredibly lengthy fermentation time in many cases. Uh, most uh, distillation ferments last anywhere from, you know, uh, around a day to maybe around a week for some um, distill- you know, popular distillates here in the United States. Uh, you know, anything more than a couple of days is, is often viewed as a very long fermentation time. Uh, but we're, you know, what we're talking about is something that spans months. Uh, and so just a couple of, a couple of things that I wanted to, um, pull in here from other spirits traditions, uh, because I, I really see Baiju as a, as a, not a fusion in and of itself, but I see a lot of aspects of the production process as being similar to parts of other, processes that are in themselves interesting. So obviously one connection to make is uh, with Dunder in the rum world. Uh, and in the webinar the other day, you did mention that, um, you know, as uh, by a Baijiu company might start, you know, producing products, a new company, for example, they might attempt to season their pits, you know, with bacteria in much the same way as as people in the rum world might use dunder, which is you know kind of the the same uh, in in the same spirit in that it is a microorganism slurry that al- allows um, some of these esters and um, aldehydes to form as flavor compounds later on down the line. So there's the dunder connection, and then of course there's the larger implications of what we would call terroir. Uh, and most people think of terroir, I think, as weather and soil conditions, but I think what we're seeing uh, with Baijo and then with, you know, in by uh, extension with the, the Dunder uh, aspect of things here is I think what we're seeing is that the, the microbiome of an area plays just as importantly into the terroir uh, of the end product and I think it's it's probably the most often overlooked aspect of terroir. So I wonder if you can maybe uh, speak to the, the dunder aspect and then um, how uh, a lot of these Baijiu uh, operations are incredibly tied to a sense of place. Oh, absolutely. So um, there's, there's a few ways in which you can uh, look at uh, terroir in, in Baijiu production. Um, one, of course, comes from the Chu. Um, most distilleries consider chu to be the most important ingredient in the baijiu, more so than even the the raw grain that you're using, um, in terms of uh, contributing to its final flavor. Because so many of these flavors over these long fermentation periods are produced uh, by the combination of the bacteria in the chu interacting with the alcohol in the mash. So um, yeah, like like the high ester Jamaican rums. Uh, those come from like you know the combination of the alcohols with bacterias that are either um, natural to the process or add in through other means. Um, so that's one one way. Chu is highly highly uh, location specific. Um, Baijiu produced in uh, like a mile apart from one another are going to taste totally different because you've got that different microclimate. Um, also, um, depending on what time of year it is, they've done some recent academic studies on Baijo and, and discovered that, uh, you will have a very different, um, chemical, uh, makeup of your, of your drink, depending mm-hmm. on whether you, uh, you know, ferment in the fall versus the spring, because different things live in the air at different times of the year. And so that's completely independent of any way that you process the the production at all. Um, it, it all just comes in from the surrounding environment. And then the third important way that um, terroir plays a role is, as you were saying, with um, these mud uh, fermentation pits in, in what we call strong aroma baijo. So these pits, they say you have to use them for about three years before they can start producing um, you know, sellable, commercially sellable baijo, because th- what happens is after you keep performing fermentation in these pits, they begin absorbing some of that, um, you know, 
micro organic culture from from the mash that's that's being fermented in them so after about three years it's believed uh, the the walls of the pit become part of the fermentation process itself and they say that 30 years is the requirement for truly top-notch um strong aroma by joe um but you can keep going um for example um we work with a distillery called uh, Lujo Lao Jiao. It's uh, the oldest continually operating distillery in China. And they have fermentation pits that have been in continuous use since 1573. So just crazy, crazy commitment to developing flavor over time uh, that we really don't have any, uh, any real comparison to, I, I think, in uh, the Western tradition. Yeah, I think the you, certainly not on the fermentation side. The the best thing I can think of would be some of the wooden stills that are um, running down um, in um, oh, I'm blanking on the rum region here. It's the one made with the uh, special type of uh, wow. I can't believe I'm I'm blanking on that. Matt Petrick is gonna kill me if he hears this. Um, but uh, but yeah, there's there's some really old stills working. But yeah, nothing even in the magnitude of what you're talking about. And, uh, you know, one, uh, there's a couple metaphors, uh, for this, uh, because, you know, I, I think it's, it's still a kind of a foreign concept, man, 30 years before something can be said to be, you know, at its, you know, at its prime or, or, or uh, performing adequately. Uh, well, you know, a couple ways to think about this would be things like, you know, very old growth vines in, in the wine world. People prize old vines because these vines have had time to, you know, dig their roots super deep and access um, layers of minerals and, and nutrients that uh, other younger vines have not had the opportunity to uh, to access. So there is, you know, something to be said for that. Uh, seasoning a good cast iron pot or pan, developing that patina takes time, uh, which is, you know, why I jealously guard, you know, my walk from 1970 that was given to me from my grandfather. It has this amazing patina on it, uh, but it didn't get there by chance. It got there by use. Uh, and so uh, there, there are, uh, we, we tend to value newness and cleanness uh, in the U.S. And uh, I, th I think there are at least a few situations where we can kind of, you know, very consciously be able to get on the same page with the, the idea of developing something over time as an asset. Um Absolutely. Wow. Where where to go next? Uh, I mean, uh, distillation, probably. Yeah. Why don't you take us through? Because I, I one of the one of the things I'm a little bit curious to um, follow up on is um, this sort of interesting still shape uh, that gets used in baijiu production because it seems to me to be in a, a another sort of middle space between pot and column still. Am I am I in the right ballpark there? Yeah, what I like to compare it to more than anything is if you um, eat a lot of Chinese dim sum, you'll be familiar with these steamer baskets, which are, you know, round and have a slotted bottom. Um, just think about one of those only, you know, make it 20, 30 times larger. Um, this is the shape of a Chinese still. Um, there's different variations of it. Um, the like uh, Filipino still uh, that they call it in um, Mexico is is one like variation on this theme. But the basic idea of how it works is if you go back to the Huangzhou when you were creating a solid mash of grains that is fermented and has alcohol inside of it. Uh, if you don't press the alcohol out of it, you can just shovel the grains into a, a, a big pot. And since this pot is open on the bottom, you can put it over boiling water and the steam will go up into this mash, heat up the mash, um, vaporize the alcohol, and you can collect that alcohol and condense it back into a liquid. That's fundamentally how the distillation of Baijiu works. Um, the way that it's more similar to a column still is that because it's a solid mash and your heat source is on the bottom and the steam's rising up into cooler grains, um, 
as the alcohol um, vaporizes, it will hit the cooler grains and condense back into a liquid as it travels gradually up the mash, getting hotter and hotter until you reach the top. You're, you're dealing with a, a, a vapor that has been distilled many times. So the mash kind of functions like those bubble caps in a column still. Uh, without you know actually having anything but a single pass through the mash yeah it's fascinating <laughs> right so if you go to a distillery like a like a gin distillery for example you know a distillery that, that pumps out a lot of gin you know you'll you'll see the that they have actual plates in their column and and the idea of these plates is that this you know the the vapor is going to rise up condense on the plate then drip down this is a process uh called reflux uh and it's, it's crazy that in the baijo production method it's literally like the the mash itself the solid the solid mash that's in there is actually functioning like those plates so as you know obviously the the grain that is closest to the heat source is going to get hot first then it's going to you know kind of it, so it's kind of like this rising action of of temperature um literally not just not just getting hotter when i say rising but also rising fit through the physical body of the mash um and again i don't think i've ever come across anything like that in u.s distillation no, it's it's fairly unique. I mean, there are some spirits that have solids inside the the mash that gets distilled, like um, grappa. I think would be a, a decent example. But certainly, there's a lot more liquid in, in most of the ones that we use that have any kind of uh, residual solids in them. Right, and so another cool part of this process. Uh, that you described in the webinar involves what happens to the, we'll call it the, we'll continue calling it the mash here, I guess, for continuity, but what happens to the mash after a distillation run has taken place? Can you, can you walk us through that? So it really depends on um, what kind of baijo you're making, but in uh a linear baijo production process, you'll have five basic steps. First, you'll steam the grains, and you perform the steaming in the same device that you use to distill the grains. Uh, you just shovel the fresh grains in there, run steam through them. They're not fermented, so no alcohol is being distilled. Uh, then you take them out, you cool them down so that they will be at an acceptable temperature uh, for yeast to survive, and then you put the chew uh, in into the grains and uh, process them in some way to ferment them. Then you distill them, and then you take them out. You uh, age them, you blend them, you sell them, you drink them, uh, etc. And what happens is some distilleries and some styles of baijiu make it more of a circular process where. After you ferment the grains, you add some fresh starches into the mash, and then you distill it. So what you're doing when you have fresh grains and fermented grains in the still together is that you're actually steaming grains and creating a new source of starch at the same time that you're distilling the fermented grains and getting the alcohol out of it. So you can take the mash out of the still, add more chew, begin fermenting the grains that you added right before distillation and just keep using that same mash over and over again. So for um, what's called light aroma baijo, um, usually uses uh, two uh, fermentations and distillations of a mash. Um, with uh, sauce aroma baijo, um, which is a very umami uh, rich baijo, that uses... Um, six to eight fermentations and distillations. But the first two cycles of the, of the eight are going to be with fresh grain added. And the last six are going to be just adding chew. So you're not actually feeding it any more starch. Um, and then Strong Aroma by Joe uses this continuous process um, indefinitely. So you have mashes that are hundreds of years old. 
Yeah, and here's another one of those places where we find these connections. What does this sound like? It, well, it sounds like a mother sauce. It sounds like a Solera process, whether you're talking about mm -hmm. aging or, or some other uh, way to think about uh, the Solera, like the Infinity Bottle, for example, would be a Solera-like process that is not, um, you know, just about aging spirits and barrels. Again, it, like what I'm still struggling to wrap my head around here is the, the number of sort of like outside little reference points or ideas that I get from the Baijiu process uh, that, uh, but that still aren't sufficient. Like just because you understand Dunder, just because you understand Solera, just because you understand somehow the process of taking a solid and getting alcohol out of a combination of two solids doesn't mean you st you have a good handle on what Baijiu really is. Uh, and so I think that's why I'm so excited about the category. Um, I was hoping that we could maybe take this as an opportunity to transition into a conversation about the styles of Baijiu, because as you mentioned, um, there are uh, 12 accepted styles, um, and within that, there's uh, a couple of main categories. So I was wondering if you could walk us through the main categories or styles of Baijiu, and then um, you know just kind of explain how they're different from one another, and maybe uh, that ties into the different cuisine styles in, uh, in, in China as well. Sure. So uh, as I said um, earlier, when you're drinking Baijiu in China, typically you're doing so at a mealtime. So it's really important to understand what the food is of the region that that Baijiu comes from, because that Baijiu is being produced with that food in mind and to pr create complementary flavors to that style of food. So um, the four main types of Baijiu are sorted by aroma, and these are just literal translations of what they call them in China. So you have um, rice aroma, which comes from Southeastern China, as the name uh, might suggest, it is made from rice and it uses a chew that is also made from rice. And this is a short fermentation, uh, usually about a few days to a week. And it tends to be the mildest of the Baijiu's, probably like closer to like soju vodka on the like flavor complexity spectrum. And the reason for that is the food in southeastern China tends to, uh, it, there's a lot of seafood and a lot of focus on texture more than having like bold flavors. So you're going to be working with lots of light, delicate foods. And this is a mild food, mild baijiu that, that goes pretty well with them. Um, then up in uh, north China, uh, specifically Shanxi and Beijing, uh, they have a baijo that is called light aroma baijo. And this is a sorghum based baijo. Uh, it uses chu that's made from barley and peas. And it's fermented for about a month. It's uh, pretty like crisp, it's dry, it's got some kind of uh, like apricot like sweetness to it. Um, I find it uh, closest to grappa if you're looking for a spirit analog. Um, and the food in northern China, it's, it's a very cold part of the country. So they um, have lots of like salt, fat, dark vinegar. Um, think of very like savory flavors like meat and potatoes is the sort of thing that you want to pair this baijiu with. Then um, in southwest China, in Sichuan province, uh, where the food is very, very spicy, lots of um, chilies, Sichuan peppercorns, uh, garlic, ginger, um, bright, bold flavors, um, and it, they have a very uh, bright, flavorful baijiu. Um, so this is made from sorghum or sorghum and several other grains that are combined, um, and it uses a wheat-based chew, and the flavors are very uh, fruity. Uh, you've got a strong tropical fruit notes, particularly pineapple is a, is a very noticeable flavor in this. Uh, you also have floral notes like anise, and you also have very like funky notes that are kind of like cheesy, creamy, um, and umami. Uh, 
And then finally, you have uh, sauce aroma is the last of the uh, major categories. And that is a very uh, long fermentation period, um, uh, up to like six months, uh, compared to like two to three months for strong aroma. And that is also sorghum based with wheat chew. And the food in that region tends to be spicy and sour. So that that baijo is strongly, strongly umami. It's got noticeable notes of uh, like sesame, chocolate, coffee, mushroom, uh, blue cheese. Like if you can think of any f- food product that you would describe as umami, like it is a flavor that you can find in sauce aroma. And uh, to that note, the name sauce aroma refers to soy sauce which is another tasting note that you'll probably get if you if you try it. Right, right. Um, now, one thing with these um, descriptors mm-hmm. is that uh, it, it doesn't really map on super well to tasting notes that you find in the West. I mean, there are some obvious, I, I think you do a good job of bridging that gap, right? Uh, we understand pineapple, we understand, you know, coffee, some of these notes we, we do understand. Uh, I'm going to read a quote from a um, an article on Punch uh, uh, entitled Wine, Baijo, and the East-West Flavor Divide, where we've got um, an example here of um, two different sets of flavor notes uh, for the same baijo. Uh, and this is, uh, I'm going to butcher the pronunciation, but Kwai Chao Mutai Flying Fairy. Guizhou uh, Mao Tai. Guizhou Mao Tai. Okay, great. So this is the Chinese set of tasting notes here. Quote, a prominent sauce aroma, elegant and exquisite with a smooth body, lingering aftertaste, and an odor that remains in the, gr- the glass long after drinking. And here is the CNS Imports, the uh, uh, Mao Tai's U.S. distributor's notes on the spirit. Quote, nose, floral, dried dates with a hint of nuts and roasted and toasted rice. Palate, silky, spicy, dry but smooth. Uh, so those are two completely different sets of tasting notes describing the same thing. So uh, knowing what we know now about the production methods and these different styles of baijo that are designed to pair with different regional cuisines. Can you talk a little bit about maybe the difficulty of, um, you know, bringing baijo into the U.S.? Uh, and then I think that'll segue us nicely into um, Ming River. Yeah, sure. So one of the first things uh, I wanted to do when I was uh, writing my first book about baijo um this would have been like 2013 that I was doing the research was get together a bunch of people um, with experience in the international like spirit wine and spirits world who had written lots of tasting notes for um, wines and whiskeys to sit down with me and taste a bunch of different baijos. I think we had about a hundred on us uh, for, for this particular tasting that became the basis of uh, the book Baijo, The Essential Guide to Chinese Spirits. Because the fact of the matter is, like, Chinese culinary philosophy and Chinese gastronomy are, is looking for very different things than, than we're looking for in our foods and beverages. And if you try to describe Baijos the way that they describe them, we won't really, they won't be terribly useful. They won't tell you the things that you are looking for. They'll tell you, they'll tell the Chinese consumer what they're looking for in their drink. But um, uh, for one thing, uh, smell is a much bigger part of uh, the, the experience. And oftentimes one thing that's quite interesting, I find, but challenging for a new drinker is that Baijos often smell quite a bit different than they taste. So there's a clear like mental separation between like what you're smelling and what you're drinking. And that holistic journey from like the nose to the mouth and down the throat and up in your head is like how the entire experience is being judged in China. 
um, that you look at the whole experience from start to finish as opposed to like one particular element of that journey. So uh, we, it was really important for me because I knew I was writing in English. Most of my readers are going to be people who are interested in spirits and are educated in you know, Western wines and spirits that they be able to approach these uh, products in a way that makes sense to them. Because we're already dealing with a category that's largely unknown um, outside of China and has all of these different styles that we're not used to, all of these different ingredients we're not used to, many different flavors we don't know. So I wanted to try to make it as approachable as possible. Um, it is essentially, you know, I wanted people to, you know, do bumper bowling before uh, they were into league play. Yeah, that's, I think that's completely <laughs> fair. Um, uh, <laughs> Wow. Um, so talk, I guess, take us maybe before we get to, to Ming River, uh, I think it would make sense to um, just explain the differences between your books right, and kind of the progression so that, um, you know, obviously we're going to link to all your books on the show notes page. Um, obviously, you had this journey, you know, you kind of described the, this hundred by Joe tasting as being the basis uh, for one of the books. And then uh, now you have uh, a newer book out called Drunk in China. So uh, take us through that. And then uh, I definitely want to give Ming River its its time because it's it's a super interesting project to me. OK, sure. So uh, I guess I told you my story up to the point that I moved to Sichuan and started researching Baijiu. Um, I mm -hmm. left Sichuan in 2013, and I'd already written um, about a year before I left. I finished the first draft of the book that became Drunk in China, which was published uh, last November. And this first draft was really the book that I set out to write because I'd been writing mostly about Chinese history and culture up to this point. I didn't have any background in spirits uh, aside from drinking a lot. Um, so I had written a book that was like mostly travelogue and had a lot of history and Chinese cultural commentary worked into it. And I pitched that book to a publisher. I was really excited about it. And they came back to me and said, this is very interesting, but um, nobody outside of China knows what Baijiu is. So why don't you write that book instead? And so that be became um, Baijiu, the essential guide to Chinese spirits. And it was very good that I, ended up publishing that book first because that project really forced me to like confront the things I didn't know about uh, alcohol and how it's made and really learn everything there is that I could learn about these different styles of Baijiu and how they're produced uh, in a much more thorough way than I was ever planning on doing. Um, so that book came out uh, in 2014. And while I was promoting that book uh, around in China, um, I gave a book talk in Beijing where I met some couple guys who had attended the talk. Uh, one of them owned like a craft spirits brand um, and wanted to open up a bar to promote it. Um, but it was so excited about Baijo after this talk that um, he and a couple of his friends decided to open their own Baijo focused bar in Beijing. And this uh, was a bar called Capital Spirits. Um, it still exists in Beijing um, in a new location with, uh, with different management, but um, it, it was a really new and interesting way to prepare baijiu um, in cocktails and also tasting flights. Whereas in traditional Chinese culture, um, you consume baijiu by the bottle. You have a half liter bottle, you take it to dinner, you drink it with your friends, and that's most people's exposure to baijiu. But being able to taste many different baijus uh, was kind of an exciting experience. So. Um, these guys started this bar and Chinese distilleries began approaching them um, and asking them how they were getting um, younger Chinese people and also foreigners uh, living in China 
uh, to drink baijiu, um, which were two groups that don't drink a lot of baijiu uh, in, you know, up, up till very recently. So Chinese distilleries wanted to know what they were doing. Um, I'd been in touch with them and I was doing some kind of consulting work of my own on the side. And so we decided to team up and create a consulting company that would specialize in introducing Baijiu to new markets. And we'd been doing this for just a few months when uh, Lujo Lao Jiao, um, one of my favorite distilleries from when I was living in Sichuan, uh, approached us and said that they wanted to create a product for the international market, but they wanted to make sure that they had the right team in place to do it. And they wanted to hire our team to help them create this brand. So um, we had intended on just consulting on the project, but they said, listen, if we're going to do this, we want to do it. And we want you to be with us uh, on the ride. So um, they made us partners in the venture. And um, in 2018, we launched Ming River. And um, as you can imagine, in the uh, five years between um, living in China and launching my own Baijiu brand, a lot of different things happened in my life. I had a lot of new perspectives trying to sell Baijiu to people in Europe and the United States. And um, so I significantly revised and added to that, that original Drunken China book and um, created a book that I think is uh, a lot better than it would have been if I had published it like when, when, I, when I first was trying to. So um, I'm really happy that that worked out that way. But um, most of my work these days is focused on getting people outside of China to drink and appreciate Baijiu. Right. Uh, and one of the things that you mentioned in the webinar uh, or that got mentioned in the webinar is the fact that, um, I mean, Baijiu, uh, it's the largest spirits category in the world with roughly 8 billion liters being produced. But in your words, like less than 1% and potentially significantly less than 1% actually leaves China. So uh, with Ming River, can you describe maybe uh, the nature of the product? Uh, I actually have a bottle heading my way. So as we promote this episode, I'm going to uh, try and do some Instagram live uh, tastings, maybe get a few more bottles here as I can scrape them together in DC and then do a bit of a comparative tasting myself with Ming River. Um, but ostensibly, you know, you're part of that less than 1% that is not just leaving China, but making a concerted effort to leave China. So what does it taste like and, and what's your, I guess, your go-to-market strategy? Sure. So um, Ming River is a baijiu that uh, we call it Sichuan baijiu because we want uh, people to know where it's from and what the tradition that it represents is. Um, and it comes from Luzhou Lao Jiao, which is the oldest distillery in China. They've been continuously producing baijiu in some form since uh, the late 16th century. And this is, I would say, a very like classic style baijiu. It's from the most popular category of baijiu, so it's fairly representative. I think anyone in China who tasted it would recognize it as, as a baijiu that uh, is is good and ready to be consumed at a banquet. But we, we made a few fundamental um, adjustments in our strategy in terms of um, how we present it. One is um, all Baijos are blended products because for a couple of reasons. One is just to maintain consistency in a product with a lot of natural variables. Uh, but the other reason is that you want... Um, to bring in as many of those different complex flavors uh, as possible. Um, so we worked really closely with the master blender at Lujo Lao Jiao um, and also some bartenders in New York. Um, so we went in with uh, and did several rounds of taste testing where we would have different samples that highlighted on different elements of the Strong Aroma Baijiu flavor uh, profile. And we would say, do you like blend A, blend B, blend C, blend D? 
and we take that feedback back to uh, the blender at Lujo La Jiao, and they would give us another four samples, um, trying to you know pinpoint what it is that the tasters we have were liking, um, and we ended up with a unique blend that, uh, again, like I said, it, it's exactly the kind of thing that you could find in China and like would be recognizable as such. But it also highlights some of the flavors of strong aroma baijiu that is easier for bartenders to work with. So it can be a multi-use product. Um, then in terms of uh, the name, th this was critical for us because we wanted a name that was um, recognizably Chinese, um, but also something that could be pronounced by someone who doesn't speak Chinese. So um, our distillery started in the Ming River. Uh, the distillery is on the Yangtze River, hence uh, Ming River is the, the name of the product. But um, unlike the distillery, Lujo La Jiao, or you know, other brands like Guizhou, Mao Tai, uh, Wu Liang Ye, uh, Arguoto, like the, the words that are basically unpronounceable to someone who doesn't have a grounding in Chinese, we feel that this is a product that people can can try and remember what it is and find it again later. So these these are these are minor alterations, but ultimately we think necessary for our product to be successful in in a market with uh, so little exposure to uh, China and the Chinese language. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, it is a beautiful bottle. I'm, I'm actually really looking forward to getting it because I think it's just quite pretty. Um, oh, thanks. And uh, yeah, so I mean, I guess to wrap up the, the main segment of the interview here, um, what do you... Uh, I mean, knowing that we're in a, a very weird time, especially uh, as uh, Sino-American relations are concerned, uh, but what do you project or predict uh, for Baiju in the coming decade? And anything that any trends that you're seeing emerge? Yeah. Um, in terms of what I predict, I think there's a tendency among a lot of people to say, you know, I've been hearing Baijiu is going to be the next big thing for a while, um, but it isn't very well known even today, to kind of dismiss it as a category. But as someone who's been laser focused on it for the last decade, um, the speed in which um, it has been, you know, accepted by the international spirits world is you know, astonishing, really. Um, 10 years ago, there were no bars anywhere in the world that were making cocktails with Baijo. Now there are hundreds. Um, 10 years ago, you would be lucky to find Baijo in an international spirits competition. Now, most of the spirits competitions are not only having separate categories for Baijo in their competitions, but also starting to recognize the different categories of Baijo, properly sorting them. Um, WSET, who we were talking about, um, they, in their, I believe it's their level three spirits program, just added Baijo as an area of study. So, um, this is these are all incredibly encouraging signs that people are recognizing both the breadth but also the quality and potential of the Baijiu category. And so um I was recently asked the same question you you just asked me, like where do I want Baijiu to be in 10 years? And the answer is I would like Baijiu to be in 10 years where um, Mezcal was five years ago. Something that Everyone knows about people who are in the know are really excited about it. And the rest of the world is about to find out about it. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great way to phrase it. Um, I, I want to make two quick observations before we jump into lightning round here. Um, one is specifically pertaining to cocktails. Um, I don't think there's a way for us to really usefully discuss Baijiu and cocktails right now, A, because it's still at such a nascent stage of development. 
Uh, and two, because I, we just need, I think myself included to do a lot more tasting before, uh, I try to really uh, add to the conversation about cocktails intelligently. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to focus on tasting myself and then obviously sharing those tasting notes with our audience before we talk about that. But I was, uh, going to mention that you have a lovely article, uh, with past guest of on this podcast, Shannon Mustafer, uh, about using Baijo and cocktails. So I am definitely going to link to that in the show notes page. Uh, it's a great read and, and Shannon is obviously just a complete whiz behind the bar. Sure. And if I might quickly add, um, Ming River, we just uh, released a book of some of our favorite uh, cocktails working with Ming River that um, you can download the PDF of uh, for free on our website that I I encourage everyone to check out. Um, But I'd also like to add that what you say is definitely true that Baijo is very new as a cocktail ingredient, but I think for many people that's kind of part of the fun is that you're working with an ingredient that there's no canon for. There's no standard Baijo cocktails that everyone knows. So you're able to experiment with it without being hemmed in by the notion of what you're supposed to be doing with it. And, and for people who are creative and like that freedom, um, the potential is pretty much unlimited. As you say that, it occurs to me that I think a a, a well organized and a well run cocktail competition uh, of the sort that many spirits brands run here in the U.S. might not be a bad thing for exposure. Uh, stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll we'll leave it at that. Um, yeah. Uh, folks, we're going to give you all of the digital ways to connect with uh, Derek and Ming River and all of his books uh, at the end of the episode here. But Derek, do you have a, a minute for some lightning round questions? Of course. All right, let's get into it. What is your favorite cocktail? And if you don't have a favorite of all time, what's something maybe that you were more recently obsessed with? Okay, I tend to veer towards sours so uh, my favorite cocktail the one that made me like a real fan of uh, cocktails was a drink called the churchill that i was introduced to at a japanese cocktail bar in shanghai a while ago Um, i believe it's three parts scotch one part vermouth one part contro and one part uh, lime juice Uh, it's kind of a modified sidecar hmm Super delicious. Yeah, that is interesting. Yeah. Ooh. Okay. I've never heard of that one. Uh, maybe we'll make that the featured cocktail for this episode so I can dig into that. But uh, obviously, uh, getting a, a, Brit- a, a cocktail with a British name came across it at a Japanese bar in <laughs> Shanghai. <laughs> yeah, that's just um, kind of the way things go for me, I guess. <laughs> All right. If you were a cocktail ingredient, what would you be and why? I was a cocktail ingredient. Um, hmm. That's a good question. I think if I were a cocktail ingredient, I would probably uh, be something like Fernet. Um, there's a certain degree of complexity. Um, not everyone appreciates me, but. Um, I think those who do really like me. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's also, uh, you know, a little, a little, you know, it, a little goes a long way. There's, there's a, there's a, <laughs> something about Fernet with, uh, that, that I, that exerts a, a really interesting influence. And I, I view Fernet as a very contextual spirit because the, the, th- what you taste with Fernet tends to be different in like a flip, for example, than it is in something like a black Manhattan. Uh, so mm-hmm. I, I like using Fernet as something that, um, you know, really uh, evolves depending on context. Uh, if you could have a cocktail with anyone in the world, past or present, who would it be? Where would you go? What would you drink? Just kind of paint us a little picture here. Okay, so this is an interesting question and one that I gave a little bit of thought to. Um, this is going to seem like an easy answer for someone who's into Chinese spirits, but it would probably be 
I would like to drink Baijiu with um, Li Bai, who was a, an eighth century poet in China, who's considered both the kind of greatest Chinese poet and also the greatest Chinese drinker. Um, I think in terms of hanging out with him, he'd probably be a little bit uh, pompous and condescending uh, based on, on what I know of him, but um, also very philosophical and interesting. And there's two reasons I would want to drink with him. One is because I am desperate to see uh, Tong Dynasty China, which was this weird period in Chinese history when China was this vast, sprawling kind of cosmopolitan metropolis where you had people from all around the world living there. Um, very different from uh, the China of other eras. Um, and also because Li Bai is considered the greatest of Chinese drinkers, but he never had Baijiu in his lifetime. So I'd like to see um, how he reacts to the the modern Chinese drink. Mm, mm, that's a that's a really nice one. Um, he is he the same? Because uh, I know that there's certain differences in spelling and pronunciation. Uh, the only Chinese poet that I'm familiar with is Li Po. Is is that another name for him, or is this a completely that, different? That is another name for the same person. Yes. Yeah, okay. Okay. That's the guy. Great. Then we'll try and uh, slip a little bit of his poetry in the show notes page because I have a poetry background as well. So very, very well, good. Well, I, I would recommend um, Drinking Alone by Moonlight is his most famous drinking poem. But um, there's one called, I think, uh, Bring on the Wine or Let's Drink that I, I like even better. Um, it has this line about uh, like a th- spending a thousand gold on uh, wine will come back again. That I, I, I think is a, a great attitude towards life. And uh, it also has one of my favorite lines that um, the great, the great like thinkers are forgotten by history, but uh, everyone remembers the great drinkers. And, and in mm-hmm. his case, it's certainly true. Very nice. I love it. I love it. Uh, okay. What is a common or traditional cocktail ingredient that you've never tasted and why? The one that came to mind um, was a uh, drambuie, and mm. it sticks out in my head because I, between uh, where I'm living now, which is Jerusalem, and I was living in, and when I was living in China, I spent a few years in Argentina, where they they drink a lot of fernet. Uh, that's where I got into that there. But one of the drinks that they had behind the counter at like every corner convenience store for reasons I've never understood was Drambuie. And mm. always see it and think like, I should buy a bottle of that and give it a shot. But um, I just never had a cause to buy it. It was never listed as an ingredient in any cocktails I was making. And uh, yeah, so to this day, I, I, I don't know what that tastes like. Yeah, Drambu is interesting because you've got this one drink, the, the rusty nail. I mean, you make a rusty nail, you need Drambu. You can't get around it. Um, but it's also a weird liqueur in that it is just sort of a, it's it's almost like a, a honey jack, like that J- Jack Daniels whiskey that's just mm-hmm. like sweetened with honey. It's kind of like that for scotch in a way. Um, so it's both interesting and not interesting at the same time. But I feel like it should be like Campari in the Jungle Bird, I feel like it's one of those continental uh, cocktail ingredients that could really be used more in the tiki space, interestingly enough, because it's the space, you know, like Absinthe um, or Pernod, uh, you know, it's it's got this very distinctive flavor that I feel like if used in small parts, Trambu could be really interested in or interesting in the tiki space. <laughs> Um, all right, wrapping up here, do you have any unusual or controversial views in the spirits or cocktail world? I, this is going to feel like a cop out, but um, yeah, that everyone should be drinking more by Joe. Uh, well, we will definitely do our best here. Um, I'm personally excited about it and I have literally never had a drop across my lips. So, um, you know, uh, honestly, Derek, what I'm hoping is that this, uh, can serve 
as, you know, kind of our essentials episode. And maybe down the line, there might be the opportunity to do some some more and more in-depth education events where we can, you know, actually get by Joe in people's hands and actually, uh, you know, start getting more into some of the nuances because, you know, uh, as, as much information as we've thrown at our listeners in this episode about things like, you know, parallel fermentation and, um, terroir and all, all these different styles of by Joe, you know, we really only have scratched the surface. Um, so, you know, oh, my, sure. my, my, my thanks to you certainly for being on the podcast. Um, can you share um, just how the best places for people to purchase your books, uh, the way that folks can um, learn about Ming River and any relevant social media stuff that goes along with that? Absolutely. So um, the best place to order my books, uh, certainly the easiest would just be on Amazon.com. Um, or if you want to order my most recent book, you can go to, um, university of Nebraska presses website. Um, I can provide a link uh, in the show notes for that. Um, my ed by Joe educational website is, uh, drink Uh, again, that's B A I J I U. And um, then uh, if you want to follow Ming River and what we're up to, mingriver.com um, and on all social media at mingriverbyjoe.com. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, I, I think, pretty much all of the resources you would need. Right. And uh, so I, here in Washington, D.C., was actually able to um, purchase a bottle uh, f uh, from from the site if you go to the, the shop option there. Uh, is there is that uh, only shipping to limited states at the moment? So we're really um, happy that um, this unfortunate uh, coronavirus situation has forced us online for the time being and made us finally break down and open up an online shop. So shopmingriver.com uh, will ship to all 50 states. Oh, beautiful. Um, well, that certainly is progress of a sort. And uh, I think that, you know, specifically for educational opportunities uh, means good things uh, potentially down the line for people who want to, you know, maybe start tasting some of these really compelling by Joe's. So, um, Derek, I just want to thank you once again uh, so much for being on the podcast. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, there's two big things you can do for us here at Modern Bar Cart. One would be to tell your friends and family if you think they'd enjoy listening to us talk about cocktails. And if they don't download podcasts, they can always stream our episodes on their desktop directly from the show notes page at modernbarcart.com. The other thing you can do to help would be to head on over to iTunes or wherever you download your podcasts and leave us a review. Five stars are great, but we're more interested in your feedback. And the beauty is, the more reviews we have, the easier it will be for other folks out there to learn about our show. We're trying to start a cocktail revolution here, and by spreading the word, you're helping us fight the good fight. You can always reach us by emailing podcast at modernbarcart.com if you're looking for cocktail or bartending advice, or if you're a pro who would like to pull up a mic and be interviewed for all to hear. Also, definitely follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Modern Bar Cart for cocktail porn, recipes, and entertaining tips. And keep an eye out for new product releases and special offers, which are happening all the time. We love our listeners and we really enjoy giving you exclusive discounts and sneak peeks at our latest and greatest cocktail projects. This episode may be over, but for you, the mixological fun and adventures are just beginning. So remember folks, drink responsibly and experiment boldly. This episode was made possible with editing and sound design by Samantha Reed, production assistance by Rachel Christian, Baijo Insights, courtesy of Derek Sandhouse of Ming River Baijo, and a little bit of interview magic by yours truly. This has been a Modern Bar Cart production, copyright 2020. <laughs>